Hello there, thanks for stopping by. I'm Colin, and welcome to Messing About with a Narrow Boat. In this episode, it's part two of my internet on a narrow boat videos. Uh, part one was about how to select the right router for you, and I'll put a link in the description. This video covers the unboxing and the setup of the RUTX50 5G SIM router that we chose, plus a select a section on basic security that you must do for any router, whether it's the home or your boat or your RV, etc. Now, like part one, it's not going to be that technical but trying to make you aware of the whys and wherefores of some security settings that you need to do. No, Colin, no! Yes! Now, to save you 20 minutes of reviewing part one, here's a quick recap. To recap... In part one, I ran through the various options that you need to consider when choosing a mobile router. We ran through a Moscow model, which is must have, should have, could have, and won't have, that reflects our needs. This led us to our choice. So as mentioned in the intro, we purchased a Teltonica RUTX50 5G LTE dual SIM router with a pointing XPOL1 4x4 MIMO external antenna. Boy, that's a mouthful. It's because we want a 5G network connection and a fair chance of getting a decent signal. And the dual SIM is, as we're continuous cruisers, if we're not getting a good signal from one provider, we want to be able to fail over to another. The obligatory youtube thing says, if you like these videos, why not consider liking and subscribing to our channel? We'll be going through the fit out of our narrow boat. Subscribe, it's free, and it lets us know if you're interested in our fit out journey. So, first things first, let's go and do the unboxing of what we bought, and then I'll drop into the setup. So, here we go, Teltonica RUTX50. What have we got? A quick start guide, love these, you have to scan them in, which means you need internet access to do it. The actual device itself, um, size, palm size. One side you've got all the aerials, on the other side you've got all the access you need. So your sims, your 2.4 gigahertz, your 5 gigahertz. You've got a WAN port and four <coughs> LAN ports all running at gigahertz. You've got that. Aerials. So, one of the things I liked about the RUTX50 was the small form factor. But if you think about the small form factor, most most routers have aerials that have to sit on them, like so. And that's why some of the some of the uh, routers are quite big and chunky because you've got four aerials they need a big footprint so that you can put the wi-fi aerials in the side <clears throat> you don't want your wi-fi aerials interfering with your network aerials but the because of the small form factor of the rutx50 they actually have the aerials on a lead and you can you can put them elsewhere and these are magnetic magnetic which is perfect for the boat so what else have we got you've got a network cable you've got the the gps antenna <laughs> uh, probably quite a good option for a van uh, in a, on a boat Meh, maybe uh, the GPS antenna, another aerial, the total of four uh, network aerials, and a power supply. And the last thing you've got in here is the SIM, SIM card adapters. 
So very quickly put it together, you can't really go wrong. Everything's labelled up. The antennas are marked mobile. The sockets where they go into are marked mobile. The Wi-Fi antennas are marked Wi-Fi. The sockets are marked Wi-Fi. And this indeed is the GPS. So that's it, all ready to go. The other thing I did buy, which was a separate item, was the separate 12 volt power lead. This means that I can plug this straight into the distribution box for our 12 volt electrics, rather than relying on a 230 volt power source. Now to the external aerial, the pointing XPO1B2 4 x 4 Mimo. Big thing. There's not much to it really. You've got an aerial, a lot of cable, some screw mounts for your house, and a user guide. Uh, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll set this up temporarily so I can test it all. So those big black cape aerials on the RU2X50 will go and be replaced by these cables. The other thing I did buy was a aerial pole, magnetic, and that will do the boat. Uh, pity, I was hoping I could find one that, that folded over. Uh, so that when you hit, when you hit a low bridge, it will tilt with ease rather than tilt with a clunk. I will continue to look to see if I can find one. So I've moved location, I've set it up, I've put the external aerial up. Actually it came with suckers, so I stuck it on my window for this test. Power adapter's in, the SIM card is in, so let's go and switch it on and see if what happens when it boots up. And off it goes, ooh, lots of lights. Flashy lights, it must be doing something. Right, I'll come back when it's done. So following the instructions, you plug in a LAN port, plug it into your laptop and connect to it and enter the username and password and it's printed on the back of the device. And on first setup, it forces you to change the password, which is good. So I failed the first rule of an out of the box setup vlog. I forgot to copy it all. But in real terms, it was really simple to set up. As soon as you power it up and you connect to it, the first thing it does is ask you to change the admin password. The next thing it does is, is run through a setup wizard. And that's all I did. I, I changed a few settings based on my security recommendations, but, but nothing else. It was not a complicated thing at all. And it was up and running. So overall, I was pretty impressed. It's plug and play. Uh, the one thing I would say is that it, it comes up quite often and tells you you need to do a firmware upgrade. And I would definitely do that pretty much first thing. Bring, bring the router and the software on the router all up to speed, and then you can carry on. So it worked. It was easy to do. Quite happy to do it. Not disappointed. But let's start with security. So let's talk basic security. On the bridge, Mr. Spock immediately ordered general alert. As I showed in part one, there are a number of security considerations. But here, I want to talk about four basic things that you must do for every single router that you have, whether it's your boat router, your RV router, your home router.
every single one should have these basic security considerations. But why? Well, on the back of almost every router, certainly domestic ones, your network name and password and your admin username and password are printed on the back of the router. Now that's very handy if you forget it or you need to give your passwords to someone, but you really should change these. If you think about it, these are on a list. They're on the manufacturers of the router and the network providers lists. And as we all know by now, lists have a terrible habit of finding their way into hackers' hands. Robots can request your SSID name and match yours to a list. Then using the same list, they can access your username and password. So always change your SSID name and your password to reduce risk. And similarly, almost every router out of the box has an administrator's username of admin. So that's 50% less work that the hackers robots have to do. It's another reason for changing their username. And it's worth stating what you probably already know. But these days, hackers are not necessarily people working an individual target, but software robots doing mass penetration attempts. So all we're trying to do really is to scupper the robot's attempts. Robot. So let's look at the SSID name or the service set identifier to give it its full name. Just show it off now. The new network name is... Your network name appears to any device that is looking for networks. You know, like your phone. You go to a cafe and you can go into your settings and Wi-Fi, and it will show you all the available networks, like Brian's phone or Mandy's phone or Sunesh's phone, etc. And quite often you'll find them as unlocked hotspots, unfortunately. So when thinking of a name, try not to make it obvious like your house name or your boat name or your postcode or your surname or any of those sort of things. A collection of letters and numbers will suffice. Just anything away from what is printed on the back of the router like EE1234 or VM972, etc. You, you can always tell the network provider from the out of the box name that's been given. And let's be honest, you can have a little fun here. So on your router, you could make your network name of say, police surveillance boat six or license audit boat. So anyone scanning for available Wi-Fi networks might get a bit of a shock. <laughs> Mind you, it might increase the number of people that want to hack your router just for the challenge. But please don't use salacious terms. That's just not nice. So change the name, change all the passwords and make them secure. Don't make it the same as all your other passwords. Write it down, keep it safe. Changing it in the router is not simple. There's no forgot my password function for obvious reasons. So basically you have to reset everything and that's a serious pain in the proverbial. And change your admin username to something that is not admin and do the passwords. Now don't worry if your network provider support won't be able to help or you're worried about if I change my passwords, they won't have access. If needed, they will ask, but really no one should ever, ever, ever ask for your password. So that's the main things covered. Sorry if it was a wee bit long. Now let's tackle the use of subnetworks or multiple SSIDs. So multiple SSIDs or subnetworks as are known are a safe way to split your Wi-Fi into segments. There are a few reasons for doing this. So for example, when friends and family come to visit and they connect to your network, you give them the password. But that password is then stored on their device forever. So they will have full access to your network. If those devices are compromised, it's possible that that releases access information to your network. So you can add additional protection by creating a subnetwork. And in addition, we have the Internet of Things devices, the IoT. 
These are the smart devices in our homes, such as light switches and TV and Alexa and Google and all that sort of stuff. But they also store passwords. Now, most Internet of Things devices typically work on the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi as the reach is longer and the speed is low and they are usually simple on-off devices. There's no demand for high bandwidth, high speed, which is why we identified this as a need and our requirements in part one. And that means that many IoT devices are pretty cheap. And so they use pretty cheap chips. A smart socket these days is very affordable. That means perhaps that the security in those chips are not the most modern and can be hacked. If a way is found to attach to those devices, it is possible to go onto your network. Now it's a little remote, I give you that, but it is possible. So the best way to reduce risk is to create a subnetwork. Uh, I don't know, Collins Network IoT. Uh, and then put all of your IoT devices on that subnet. At least then you've got some level of protection. And this is a good recommendation if you've got a number of smart devices in your home or your boat or your van, whatever. And the last example I can give of subnets is a kid's network. You can control access times then, you know, so they can only have access to the internet between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. Monday to Friday, for example. And you can block websites and apps. So if you don't want them on TikTok, you can block it. And you can manage things like, hey, kids, it's seven o'clock, internet's going off, time for bed. <laughs> now, there's a lot to be said for that. Mind you, I did this with our kids when they were very young and they never spoke to me for a month. So that leaves just one final security control, which is the remote access permission. So, so the final critical setting is remote access, or some call it remote management. It'll be slightly different depending on your router make. It should be off by default, but you need to check. If a hacker gets access, the first thing they look at is remote access. This allows them to take remote control of your device. Not a good idea. They can change names, passwords, all sorts of things to deny you access. Switch it off. If the need arises for support teams to access your device, it's under your control. You can switch it back on if it's needed, but I've never known it to be needed in a domestic environment. So to sum up, your router is your gateway to all your secure stuff. Do what you can to make your router secure, and these simple things will help enormously. Now, I'm not trying to scaremonger hacking, but these changes are quick and easy. So why ignore your router security? Now, I hope you found this part two of the Internet on a Narrowboat Explainer interesting and useful. So please remember to like and comment if you like the content and click the subscribe button and the bell icon to get notifications of future vlogs. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.